deep into pruning. We're going to go over perennials, grasses, because the biggest blunder I see here with grasses, uh, Johnny is, is coming up with, he's actually a horticulturalist. I mean, he actually, arborist, he does trees like no one else. He does my own trees. Uh, he'll come go over details with that. He has some live examples. And then we'll follow up with some questions at the end. Probably the last 15 minutes, we'll just have Q&A. And if we didn't cover what you wanted, we'll just cover that, okay? So in your seats, I gave you Johnny's info. Uh, he's probably the biggest pruning company in town. Uh, so he can. Eddie's the expert. Uh, my pruning, if it's small, I do it all myself. If it's anything of size, if I need a ladder, I call this guy. So Johnny's Tree Service, Johnny Schaefer, he's, he's the largest uh, professional. He's the only guy that's got arborists on staff. So actual people that know trees. Uh, everyone says they know how to prune trees. Most of them are butchers. Uh, they, they actually do horrible things to trees that take years to grow out of. So if you do it wrong, it's an art form. To do pruning correctly is an art form. He's got it. So he's done some massive jobs for me that required, I mean, cranes. We've done some big things together. I had some small stuff. So he does firewise stuff. He does cleanups. He does big, whatever you got. He's got the equipment to pull that off and the crews to do it. So. Anyway, I invited him to come in to help share the lime life and just get an expert's opinion on how do you really do this. I always pick something up new every time I listen to another gardener. And that's part of the joy here. Go for Thank it. You, Ken. Give, him a, give him a round, will you? Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for showing up. Uh, really, very much appreciate everyone caring so much about proper tree pruning. Um, as a certified arborist, I do see a lot of improper work done out there. Um, it kind of irks me to see if some, we have some 100 year old trees in this town that have been absolutely decimated by improper pruning by companies who claim to be professionals. Um, I had a nice little uh, screenshots of some trees that are around town that are key notes. Um, to start off, I'd like to introduce myself on the subject. I am Johnny. I own Johnny's Tree and Landscaping in Prescott. We're a full service tree company, landscape maintenance. Um, I am a certified arborist. I do bids. I'm a consultant. So if you have problems with your trees, I am the person who comes out and takes a look at them. Um, like Ken said, we also employ certified arborists who actually prune your trees as well too. So that's what we're about is promoting certified arboriculture. No more, I'm a tree guy. Uh, we are definitely trying to push for that. There's a difference. Trees are biological living things that can be very adversely affected by improper cuts, wrong pruning seasons, disease, all that. Um, really want to start off with the basics on your doing your own tree work at your house. Like Ken said, if they're small, um, yes, you can go ahead and take care of them. And that's the most important phase that a tree of life is going to go to. Generally, first year, nothing. Second year, maybe a little something. Um, if you're gonna first thing to do with a tree for structural integrity, just prune out dead, broken, dying, disease, anything like that. Other than that, you wanna leave your trees alone for the first you know, year or two, depending on the shape they're in when you put them in the ground. So what I generally do is come in, uh, start with what's called a structural prune on a tree. Um, when you come in to look at your tree after the first year, I'm gonna come in as an arborist and tell you, okay, well, I'm gonna structurally prune this tree for many different things. I want one, I want root initiation, I want root growth in this tree, so I'm not trying to bring the tree back too much in the first you know, couple years. Leaves are the food factories of trees. That is how they photosynthesize and make carbohydrates, that's what makes the tree grow, that's what makes the root system established. I've seen a lot of people get a little bit carried away in the first part of their planting their, their maple, um, and they want uh, to go in and just kind of clean everything out of it. And I'm trying to encourage people, don't over prune. Over pruning is a huge thing that we're noticing around here. People, you know, lion tailing trees, stripping out all your interior, just leaving green fluffs on the ends. Um, and you can Google what that looks like if you have not seen it, but it does happen in this town quite frequently. Um, and there's some perfect examples on Mount Vernon. If you drive up and down that street, you'll see trees that are completely skinned up on the side. There's no interior branches at all. So if you're going to be, uh, if you look at some of the trees down there, you're going to see a lot of what the pruners do to go in and take off everything on their scapula branches and leave all their growth up here. 100% wrong way of pruning a tree. 
With these young trees, you want to encourage what's called taper on these trees. You want to build a diameter on their scaffolding branches. So what you want to do is leave a few of your lateral buds on these trees. The reason it's important is trees produce carbohydrates, which move all up and down the xylem, the phloem of a tree. The uh, cambial layer is actually what builds girth in there. So if you have a small twig that's hanging out right there, what's going to happen is the carbohydrate will slow down, stop, and build what's called taper right here. Push this this way so it films. Okay. So as far as structural pruning, you're going to come up on your first young tree, and I'm going to identify any dead, broken, diseased, or dying in it. Um, this, is a, this is a plum tree, fruit tree. I mean, generally these ones you can attack pretty heavily, and you don't really, depending on how hard you prune them, it's so much faster they're going to come back, so it's a, it's a balancing act. The rule of one-third always applies. I generally like to use the term 25%, a quarter of the uh, growing um, capability of the tree. So if I'm going to come in and start my first structural prune, I'm not going to take everything out of my lower limbs to start. There's something called subordination. People are always like, well, take that limb off right now. Says, well, no, I don't want to take that limb off because I'm trying to build good taper on my trees. So what you can uh, come, come do, this is called a heading cut. Um, generally, on a lot of my other uh, deciduous trees, I have more laterals to come back into because the way fruit trees grow, they're going to have some heading cuts in them. So if I'm going to try to do a uh, scaffolding, but train this scaffolding branch, I'm going to subordinate this back into a lateral bud. I'm going to stop the growth of the apical dominance, which is right here. Everything that has growth on it at the tip has an apical bud. All your growth hormones, auxins, cytokinins, gibberellins, acidic acids, ethylenes, everything is transpiring through this limb here. Oxin resides in the tip of it, and this is what we're trying to cancel out and slow down. By me taking that bud off of the tree, I just now invigorated more growth to the lateral bud. Slowed down growth here, but now the lateral will assume the apical dominance on that, but I just canceled out all that right there. So what I'm gonna do is go around the tree, and uh, this is just the first few years of training. I know ever later on down the road, you may wanna elevate your trees up, because yeah, they're head knockers, you can't mow your lawn. But you don't wanna be aggressive with it for the first few years of establishment. Build what's called good taper, and go from there. If you ever walk through the forest, you know how you see those really tall ponderos of pines are about this big around 100 feet tall. That's called bad taper. And when a windstorm comes through, what do they do? They break and they snap off. They don't have good taper. So as arborists, our job is to develop good taper, good scaffolding branches, good root structure. That's what makes all of them work together. So generally, as you go through, in the first few light pruning sessions you'll go through, on the fruit trees, I try to take out anything that is going on the interior, definitely. You're not trying to have all this inside there. And anything that would be broken, that dying out of this thing, you're gonna take that out. Depending on when you plant it, for the first year, I'm not going to do anything but, like I said, dead, dying, disease, broken, stuff like that. I want green. I want this thing, the food factors of this tree, producing lots of carbohydrates. They're going to store it all in the root system, and then next year they're going to come back with more vigor, more vitality. This is what we're after on the tree. So don't keep starving your tree and taking the, the leaves out of it. Another really good thing to, for the tape player saying with lion tailing is do not let someone come in and start stripping everything from your interior and leaving it here. Like I said, apical bud, that's where all the growth goes, and it's going to get weak and it's going to snap off. Um, I'd like to touch on some very common species that we all deal with around here. Excuse me. We're going to do some touching on some evergreens and also deciduous. One of the most common trees that we are asked to come in and prune would be an elm, Siberian elm, not Chinese elm. Uh, people keep on mistaking it. And Chinese elm is actually an amazing tree. We love it. We're trying to propagate more of them than from the valley. So if you hear our company promoting Chinese elms, we're not just promoting an invasive tree, but I actually like this tree because it grows without water. Um, if you know how to prune one properly, it can be a very good asset to your property. But here's the, here's the first mistake that a lot of people do. They're like, well, I want you to prune and lace out my tree. Um, they want, they're afraid of you no know, wind, they're afraid of uh, you know, snow loads, all this and that. And they think, literally, if you take all the interior out, the wind will blow through it. It doesn't really work that way with these trees because, again, all their apical dominance being on the tip. The right way to prune your trees is not from the inside out. I mean, that, that's not, trees don't care about that. If it dies off, it means it's not getting sun. The proper way to prune a tree is from top in. You gotta subordinate some of these species of trees out there. 
If you have a maple, we're not really worried. They don't break out. A lot of the trees we have around here, very, very fast, vigorous growers. That means very weak wood, because they don't have any time to actually build those fibers, the lignans, all, all those uh, cellulose that actually creates these things flexibility in the wind. Um, with the elm tree, um, it's very, <laughs> it's, it propagates every year. It is invasive, sprouts by your fence lines, sprouts by your, your foundations of your houses. But the ones that are the nice, uh, in the middle of your yard, we actually go through and we try to baby these things. So if I'm going to come in and prune your elm tree, what, I, what I'm sick and tired of seeing people do is, like I said, they're going to strip out all your interior. What you want to do on a lot of your species of trees is leave some of your interior in there. This one I would take out because of the way it's growing into itself. But then we're going to give you an option on how to prune your tree. Do you want just a prune, which is take out your crossers, acute angles, dead, dying disease, all that. We are trying to sell more crown reduction on our trees. A crown reduction is very misunderstood by a lot of people. They think we're going to talk to your tree. It's like, oh, don't talk my tree. Like, well, that's not what we're suggesting here. We never would, especially not for this variety of tree. Um, what we're suggesting is a crown. To properly crown a tree takes proper tools, equipment. It takes a bucket truck. You don't let someone tell you, I'm going to go ahead and crown your tree. This is small, and you have good ladders to come back into. We do all of our crowning jobs for a bucket truck, which takes hours and hours with a certified hours. With one of these, mainly, is what he's using. Even on huge trees, it's what we're coming into. Some handsaw work, some chainsaw work, and some bigger cuts. But we're going to mostly be subordinating the tops of your tree. And how that's done, we're going to come in, and we're going to start pruning your apical bud out of the top of it, back to another lateral bud. So that's not, that's not it. We're going to, after we do that, then we'll subordinate your lateral bud. So I'm going to take it back to there, and I'm going to take it back into there. I just took out probably two years worth of growth out of the top of your tree and made it safer. I didn't create epicormic sprouting. I didn't create water sprouts from this tree. I slowed it down is all we did. With, and this is all species specific, but again, people are constantly taking an elm tree, cottonwood tree, and lacing it out, as they call it, thinning everything out on it. That's a really big problem we're dealing with. Another big problem we're dealing with out there is, I'm going to use a handsaw for it, but they're using chainsaws on these trees. So they're going to say, okay, I'm going to go prune your tree. I'm going to make your tree safe for you. The biggest thing I keep on seeing by these tree guys is they're going to come in there and say, I'm going to make your tree safe and shorter. They're literally going to take your tree, which is called a heading cut, and this is the worst part. They don't just make the wrong cut. They tear it, and they make sure it's all beat up for you, too. So if you drive anywhere around town, you will witness this pretty much everywhere. Um, don't trust someone because they say they're an arborist either. That's a big thing that I'm getting. Is a certified arborist show up and say, well, this guy said he was an arborist. So I trusted him. Was he a certified arborist? Does he have a number? Can he show it to you? Does he have a portfolio? Does he have a reputation? Because I've had, as a consulting arborist, I go to a lot of these jobs right here. And the clients trusted him, and he destroyed it and asked me to fix it. And I explained to him it takes many years, if I ever can, to do restoration pruning on these trees. I can't just fix it. So that's the kind of cuts that we're trying to stay away from. Just took the bark, tore it all the way down. This will never seal. It won't. Reason that it won't, it is not in what's called the reaction zone on the branch collar of a tree. When you prune a tree back, every tree has a branch collar. I'll show you this one here. You'll see this little angle that protrudes right up here. It's where the, bark, uh, the stem and the limb come together and it builds this branch bark ridge. That is the, uh, the collar just outside that. That's where you make your pruning cuts. People are all, I mean, and then <laughs> they, they, I see people try to do this properly. And I, granted, it does take time. It does take a little bit of finesse. And some trees are harder to read a branch collar on than others. This one has pretty good defining, especially this one right here. And for you people over there, I'd like to point it out again. You're looking right here. There's a little angle right there. So if I'm going to take this tree, I'm going to prune it back into the branch collar right there. That's called a thinning cut. I'm going to take it all the way out. This was a heading cut right here. Preferred trees, we definitely try to do more of those. So the reason it's important is there's meristematic cells in here that causes this to seal off and ward off decay, bacterial, fungals, all that. If you made a heading cut, those are not there. It just stays open. It never seals off on the tree. 
So it's important to put them back together so they start sealing off. Um, that would be a big part of the branch collar, knowing where that comes into on the tree. So every time you'll see one of our trees done, which we have a lot of them, and we do a lot of work on Mount Vernon as well too, restoration pruning, after they did the work over there, you saw the crowns dying back. That's why you saw some street butchery in the past few years down there, is they just call it tree guys. And they ended up doing a lot of this. Another thing you don't do is with the stress tree, like for those trees down there, they took green foliage out of the tree. Well, you don't do that to a stress tree. So we're trying to do restoration pruning, leave the green food factors in the tree because it's building new trees because your root system's in jeopardy. So we're gonna come in and just subordinate. We subordinate all the grounds on the ones we did down there. It was all dead that we brought back into laterals. And it takes a long time to actually do this. Very few people, um, if, you, if you know, they are inclined to worry about the safety and they love their tree, they will spend the money on it. But this is literally what that arborist is doing in that bucket the whole time, bringing everything back. So he's gonna go ahead and make your whole tree safer and shorter. Well, how's that would beat that up instead of a nice one? Uh, so, okay, so that would be deciduous elm. And then another big thing that we get called out to do, unfortunately, is to remove these Diodara cedars and remove big evergreens because they were never pruned. Um, there is actually a way to subordinate an evergreen tree. Granted, this can't be done all in one time. You can't all of a sudden wake up 20 years, oh, it's too big, I'm going to subordinate this thing that is small. I've seen, again, I've seen people try to do this. They literally go out there and they're gonna make a big old heading cut on your tree and say, oh, now it's smaller. Well, you, you can't make a big heading cut on a tree. Granted, this is a Diodara cedar, you can prune back into the lateral bud on that. But generally what we're trying to do is shrink your tree. We do what's called tipping on your tree. We're gonna take your evergreen tree, which has gotten too big. It's on the walkway, up against the house. We do not know it's gonna get that big. So we do we come in and do, we do we start uh, just start tipping your tree back. Which again, thousands of cuts. Unfortunately, tree pruning has to be very patient. You can't get in a hurry with this stuff. And then we're gonna go ahead and subordinate back there. I just took out two years worth of growth on your evergreen tree. And believe it or not, take a limb like that, times it by a hundred, and we have to do those cuts on every limb on your tree, subordinate that thing back in. That's proper subordination tipping on an evergreen tree. Um, being a Diodora cedar, these things can take more of abuse than a lot of your evergreens can out there. Um, some of them do not recover as well as Diodora because of the way they grow. Very invigorating tree. You can blow up the whole central leader on this tree and it will sprout a new one. So it's a great tree to uh, plant, just don't plant it too close to your houses because it becomes a maintenance nightmare. It costs you a fortune. We have a saying in the arborist world, right tree, right place. Um, it's so sad for me to come in sometimes and I can't do anything, I gotta remove it. And that kind of breaks my heart. So I was like, I said, it's such a beautiful tree. Why do I have to do that to that tree? Um, but it wasn't the right tree, it wasn't the right place. So a big thing is understanding like when you're buying a tree from your gardener or a water, understand, say, well, how big does it get? Look at the label on that thing. Understand how big it gets and what you're dealing with and that will help your location. You know, uh, waters, they know these trees, and every time I go to one of their jobs, it was the right tree, it was the right place. And thank goodness, I just I keep going to these places where these people just slam in these landscapes real fast. We come in through 10, 15 years later, we do <coughs> capture landscape because it was the wrong tree in the wrong place. Hey, John, before you move on to that, so I just had a neighbor had a deer cedar planted maybe 10 yard, 10 feet off the driveway. Of course, those get 25 feet wide. Yeah. So starting to impede into the driveway, and he just pruned it up. He went up to about this tall, no branches. So all that swooping big branch. Is that okay? Or how? What's the rule on how high you have to prune something back? It probably should have been removed, but he didn't want to do that because it's mm -hmm. 30 feet tall. Over there. Yeah, um, and thank you. That's actually something we get asked a lot too on elevating trees. Um, there's this thing called fire code out there where the tree has to be so high. Well, I've seen guys take 10 foot trees and elevate six foot, you only have four foot left on top, it looks absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> you're, you're gauging off of the size of your tree. And again, remembering the rule of 25% or rule of thirds. Don't never take out more than a third of your tree during any pruning season until it has a chance to reestablish that growth on the tree. So if you're gonna take it, if that tree was, say, pushing 25 feet tall, yeah, that's, that's fine right there. But unfortunately, it should have been done, like I said before, he should have been subordinating that tree over the course of years, but all of a sudden he woke up one day and decided to do something about it and had to elevate that high. 
Generally, with Evergreens, uh, we deal with, um, they are doing a lot with those scaffolding branches that are low. I don't like to elevate my Evergreens too high. Some people do. Um, it's detrimental, it really is. Uh, and we are getting hot around here. So as a big thing as a consulting artist, I'll show up on a job and someone's like, well, why is my tree all burned on this side? Or why is this happening? There's something called volatilization of the heat in the ground pulling nutrients out of the ground. And the needles and those limbs help protect all that. It's just sitting there shading it and saying, no, roots don't like heat. Roots hate heat. They actually feel exactly the same way the crowd does. They do respire. So keeping the root system cool is very important. If you elevate all the way up, you're going to have the ground radiating heat. It is not good. It really heats back up. I generally like to have my evergreens one to two feet off the ground. I think it looks nice, but in a certain location, it has to be fitting the location it's in. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And yes, we'll even do stuff that we don't really want to do, but we have to to save the tree. In a perfect world, if I could prune every tree from baby all the way on up, they'd all be exactly where they should be. But we have to make allowances for certain things that change in the environment. Uh, elevating a tree is a thing that we do. Don't recommend too high on it. But it is kind of nice to get up off the ground. People like to have little buddies and rodents and everything in there, which I totally get. Um, but yeah, elevating trees is something that you absolutely have to do when you're living in an urban environment. Another very common tree, which you all should recognize, the wonderful alligator juniper. Um, love it. Very famous tree. Everyone loves this tree. Uh, we prune these every day out there. Um, big thing with the alligator juniper, any native out there, I generally tell my clients, I'm not trying to really take any green out of your tree. Um, again, it's a native. If it died off, it means the sun couldn't get in there and didn't be there. A big thing is like Embry Oaks out in uh, Woods Valley. Um, and these, these are the big ones that we do out there, and people tend to just gut them. They lie and tell them. They strip them, even these, and uh, it's, it's, it doesn't kill them then, it's slowly killing their trees when it takes time to do. So with the alligator juniper, all I'm really telling my clients to do is come in, and we're going to take out all your dead wood out of your tree, and all your broken ones out of your tree. And another big problem we have with your alligator juniper, is snow low. These things are breaking all over town. That's another big thing I see. It is important to prune your natives because it means people like, oh, well, they haven't pruned forever. So, well, if you ever walk in nature, you'll see them decimated and broken everywhere. There's a way to help this. People keep on saying, oh, again, I took out all the interior so the snow could fall through it. And this is what they start going to it. And again, you're creating bad taper, you're lion tailing. And here's the funny thing where does snow land? It lands out here. I've never seen the snow build up in here before. It doesn't matter if it builds up in there. I'm not worried about that. So I tell my clients, if you want me to help your tree, I need to subordinate. Is a term we use a lot out there, but tipping is what it's going to come back into. So I'm going to take it back into there. That, so a simple math, a pound weighs a pound right here, but it keeps increasing the flavor goes out. If I take one pound off your limb, that is mathematically depending how long that uh, branch is, is a lot of weight. And snow can accumulate on the tip of that branch to break your tree. And the reason we follow up with the tipping job on it, along with your pruning job, is once you take some of this exterior out right here, you're going to see your interior and all that dead. So we always follow up with a crown clean, dead, broken, disease. Take it out, let us support it, the tips on it. What's really cool is you actually don't see the cuts. You know you did it right when you hide your cuts. You want to be hiding your cuts when you're making these. Um, these are notorious for blocking my clients' views out there. They show up all the time. This is called Vista Pruning. And they're like, that tree's in my way. I, I, I don't like that tree in my way. I have a million dollar view. It's like, yeah, you do. So we have some options. And if I'm going to destroy your tree and make it look absolutely terrible and potentially kill it, I won't do it. I'll tell you to remove the tree because, I mean, we're not going to have that black mark on our record for sure. Um, so we'll come in and do what's called Vista Pruning, and we subordinate the whole top of this tree back like egg is growing up we're going to go stuff like this and bring it back in so now there's our view right there okay i got a view most clients want to go sit in their patio or deck or look out their window and see it it's called vista pruning it's something that can be done right but the main thing i see is i'm going to vista prune your tree <laughs> that's what i keep seeing out there and these do not have what's called dormant nodes they have 
few of them in there. It's one of the very few juniper species that can reach straps and laterals on them. But if you make this too heavy back into your mature bark, they can't push through that. They can't. So what you're left with is an ugly vista. And like, okay, well, I, I, I can see my view, but God, the obstruction is terrible now. And, I, and then my clients, if ever someone does that, I generally come in and say, just, just remove, we can't deal with that anymore. And it was a very big, valuable tree in many instances, and we're like, we wish, we wish we wouldn't have had them do that. We are so, and, and that's where it comes down to certified arborist, not a tree guy, because this is what we keep on dealing with out there. Understanding what works and what does not work on it. I'm sorry, Ken, I said that big mess for you. <laughs> Another species that we do a lot of work with, pines, yes, spruces, yes. Um, same concept. You're dealing with a tree with all of its able to dominance, like everything else out here on your tips. And again, it gets so big, no one knows what to do with it. Now these are pretty self-explanatory because they gave you all your lateral buds on there. And you always go to our client's house, like, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and thin your tree out for you. You just sit there, take everything back. You prefer to have two laterals to come back into, just because it hides that cut better. And you can go over the course of the whole tree and subordinate this whole thing. And if you have an off-balance tree, like a lot of the times, you'll see your Austrian pines, you'll see uh, Scotch pines, and we, our wind comes from that direction, so we pretty much are all leaning this direction. But then you're going to notice on the southernmost side of that tree, it's shrunken, it's discolored, it's mutated. Look, like, why is this side so healthy? Why is this side not? Trees use something called transpiration. It's evaporation of water through the stomata to cool themselves down. Some trees are more drought tolerant. You're not going to see it as much in them. But the more wind you have, the more sun exposure, you're going to get more of that. So we come in. We try to recommend proper irrigation on that side of the tree. Um, but we also say we can do what's called tip to balance your tree. So we'll come up on a property where it's all shaved up on this side and all growing on this side. If it keeps doing that, all your info dumps moving this direction, your tree is just lopsided. That's going to fall over, but you want to make a tree, the tree should have aesthetic value. So we come in and we start subordinating that side of the tree to make it match your other side of the tree. So we're canceling out that growth hormone to move it back to this side of the tree and slow it down on this side of the tree. I don't want to grow on that way anymore, so we're going to go ahead and take that, take that off. Very nominal pruning on the inside of most of your like scotch pines, uh, definitely ponderosa, only definitely, don't ever take green out of ponderosa. I've seen people do that too. A uh, big part with uh, ponderosas and your evergreens. I like to do most of my heavy pruning on these trees during your dormant season. They say bleeding sap doesn't necessarily adversely affect a tree, and that's through all of our ISA studies and all this and that, but I have had it drip on sidewalks, drip on decks. Um, it is a attractant to the hips bark beetle and the turpentine bark beetle to have that pheromone move around there. So I recommend to clients, let me come in and make any major cuts, green cuts that I may have to make on your tree during dormant season, and let's say they are respiring. They are still using photosynthesis the winter time because they're evergreens. So what we do is we're going to prune it off and that little bit of sap that wants to come out of that cut will slowly start to calcify before the tree wakes up and you're not going to have a gusher on your hands. That's the reason I say species specific. What, what kind of tree is it? And what style of pruning are we going to recommend for that tree? Um, with the, with the, again, with the evergreens, nominal pruning, tip to balance, which is a big thing we do just to shrink these things. Um, it's very time consuming, it's very time consuming, but if you love that tree in that location, it's the only application is tip to balance it back out again. Um, and it's thousands, I mean, uh, and I'm not joking, it's thousands of cuts to do this job right. Um, and again, only a certified arborist is actually understand what that terminology is, to tip, back to laterals, crown. I always tell people, if you wanna interview your tree guy that you have showing up, ask him to identify first, where's the branch column on that tree? Try it. And then I've had, I've had some interesting comebacks on this actually from a couple of my, uh, my clients. So, oh, well, we're still getting bids, we're still getting bids. And they told me how much they love their tree. And I'm like, you know, this is, competition is good, certified arborist is best. 
You can't find one because there's not one. We are the only ones that are working certified arborists in the field. That's me, my other one, uh, people out there. When this guy, he said, when the, the, the client told me this, he said he was certified. Okay. Um, if he is, ask him for his number. Then the most important thing is ask him where the branch collar of your tree is and where your apical bud is. He was coming that day. I got to call the next day to get a job. And he was half my price, too. But he, was, she, he, he, he told her something that he, she wanted to hear, but it wasn't true. So I tell a lot of my clients, protect yourself. Don't be afraid to ask the person who's coming to give you an estimate. What are your credentials? Why should I trust you with a living biological thing that can be destroyed very easily, that cannot be fixed? Always ask. Always don't be afraid to ask for their, their work comp, their insurance, their credentials to make sure they know how to properly do that tree. The sad thing is, they can absolutely kill and destroy your property, meaning tree, and you can't do a thing about it because they're not certified. There's no recourse against a tree guy or a tree company. We are licensed, we are certified. If we come in and destroy your property, we are liable. We are held to a certain higher standard. Um, as certified arborists, our job is to look out for the tree, first and foremost for that tree, and then try to make what you want to happen within that spectrum. Because a lot of my clients will say, well, I want you to blow the top out of my ponderosa. Uh-uh, I'm not doing that. He goes, what? Well, one, you may say that now, you get it done, one, it's the completely wrong thing to do. When that tree dies, you have legal recourse against me. And when the ISC board comes to me and says, Johnny, why did you do that? Um, exactly, wrong. So I can lose my cert if I do something that is outside the scope of ANSI A300 pruning uh, practices, which is where we get all of our pruning practices from ANSI A300 and many other fertilizers and everything else. We are basing this off of many, many years of research that has been proven to work. Also, as certified arborists, we're not certified and done. We have to do continued education units. We have to continually keep learning what's out there, new findings that are coming out there, understanding not only the tree, but the things that affect our tree. If I improperly prune your tree at the wrong time of year, I have to know, and then uh, if it's stressed out, I have to know, okay, am I going to adversely affect this thing or am I going to help this thing? So understanding that I have to continually, and my arborists have to continually keep up their CEUs to know how to do this and to keep you aware of anything that could be detrimental coming through the neighborhood. And there's a lot of stuff coming from the neighborhood for these right now. A lot of disease, a lot of fungals, bacteria I deal with every day. And depending on what I'm dealing with, I'll make my suggestions to you as to I think we should do it this time of year. No, I'm not recommending touching it at this time of year. People think you cut that big thing off. Like, no, 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 that's a, that's a collar. You cut the outside. You'll have emery oaks with big collars just big around protruding all up and down it. You don't cut those off. They'll never seal, they'll never heal. So you're trying to just bring it back into the branch collar, which this one here, let me use the ash actually, way better. So you see where the stem, which is attached to the trunk, starts to change. You have a bulk, big buildup here. You make this. Excuse me. Can you hold it up yeah, one second here. Let me get these cumbersome things off here. So here's where the branch is coming in. You see a very defined ridge right there. That's your branch collar in there, or the branch bark ridge. Your branch collar is just outside that. So you're going to come in and prune right there at an angle, right in there. If that changes, you're going to follow, follow it. Trees change. Your, your branch collar is going to change. So you're going to follow it. As long as you're close inside that area, you're fine. The worst thing you do is do what's called a flush cut. And that's another big thing we get is people come in here and they prune off the collar and say, oh, I made a nice smooth. Then they'll keep shaving it down. Well, that's the last thing you want because now you cut off all that sealing, all that healing. All your marismatic cells are right there. They cut it off. I would rather see people cut it a little out past it versus cut into it. Because I can come in later and I can fix that. I can't fix it when they've been a little flush cut on there. That's what we get really proud of those for some reason. Oh, I cut it really smooth. And we'll know you just cut it all off and now it will seal on you. So understanding where, where the collar is is paramount. You have to know where the branch collar tree is. And it's really important. I always tell my clients, 
You don't have to utilize Johnny's Tree Landscaping as certified arborist. But understand if there's someone you trust out there or someone that you want to have come look at your trees or prune your trees, you now have the ability to maybe be a little bit smarter than them are, they are and say, hey, where's the branch column? And when they can't find the branch column on a tree, when they don't know where your April bud is on the tip, when they don't know where that is, you probably shouldn't let that individual touch your tree. You've got to be able to identify it. And I come on so many where that person couldn't even identify the tree, let alone identify how to prune it or what it was. Um, I do a lot of consultations out there. I say, uh, our door is always open for phone calls on that. I always say it's, cheap. it's always best to get a certified arborist opinion on it before you go someplace else on it. Always do your homework. Yes? Outside. Do the cut on that and pass it around. Is okay. That correct, that correct color? Oh, well, well, outside the branch collar. So if we're going outside the branch collar, there's your branch collar. The further away from the Further, well, that, this, I, I'd rather see someone do that than do that. So if you want to pass that around, well, if you're able to pass it around, that's a very defined branch collar on that. That is what you're looking for on the tree, on all trees. Every tree has a branch collar. Some are more yeah, defined. And that's coming for you, so you'll have, just shows you exactly how to do that. It's complicated. Uh, but making it too flush, what he, what he said, that's the biggest mistake I see. Make, taking it too far back. Could you explain what are they currently teaching on pruning sealers? So you make a cut in that black tar, what are they teaching the herbivores right now? Good thing to do, a bad thing to do, or what's what's the current take on it? Because it swings back and forth. Yes, um, and that's a big, big, uh, that's a big misconception on pruner seals out there. Back in the day, you know, we thought they were actually sealing the wound off disease, insects, and in some instances they actually can. But we realized over the course of time, what that actually does, it's like putting a band-aid when you cut your finger, and the moisture and everything grows behind it, because there's no way for it to breathe. I've, uh, if you put the pruner seal on there, you understand that trees are constantly off-gassing because lenta seals on there. If it creates that vapor barrier, it gets stuck behind that. It can actually create rot and decay, fungi, bacteria behind that pruner seal. Um, and there's, I see a lot of people that just take like spray paint. Now we're not trying to. There's certain things that are phytotoxic to these things as well too, which means activated by the sun, they come uh, poisonous to the tree. It's way better to just prune the limb off in the the reaction zone of the tree where it will seal itself off um, and not put anything on it. In fact, they invented pruner seal I mean, for a reason. There are some good standard uses for it. Uh, we've had some diseases go through, not here with, with the oak trees, but then they can get sudden oak wilt. Uh, um, they do get slime blocks. They do have, they have some uh, really bad um, uh, resurgence of uh, just like uh, bacterial and infections that were being vectored in by insects. And they realized that it wasn't suggested by ANSI standards, but they didn't have a choice. The, the, the insect population carrying these fungus better was so bad, they used it. But once that was gone, out of, they got out of their area, they stopped using it again. It's not detrimental. I don't recommend it. I've seen them heal way faster with that and a lot less problems. A lot of, I mean, and that's another thing I see too, is I'll go around to some of these places with these guys with these terrible heading cuts on the streets, and by making the client feel good, I guess they would just prune or, prune or seal it up. It doesn't do anything for the tree. It really does not. The only time I've ever used it, and now used the more tar stuff, is I've had some ponderosa pines that would just bleed profusely. And it was over a deck or a walkway. That's why I'm doing it. And I would sit there and seal it. I've gone as far as taking burlap up in these trees, and I'll staple it onto it because it's just bleeding that bad. And then I'll take it off the next year, and it's cal calcified and it's fine. That's why I say, Understand when to prune it, when to do it. You shouldn't have to if you do it the right time of year. If you have a ponderosa pine, you have to take a big limb off over your roof. Wait until it's not pumping so much of the vascular system. It's going slow. It's going to slowly seal itself off by the time it wakes up. Most all that pitch will be calcified on it. So it did its job itself. The pruner seals because we did it at the wrong time. It's just that kind of feeling that we keep going for hours. I could. <laughs> <laughs> but I told them we'd give Q and A since they want to ask some questions. Yes. So when you get done pruning, you've got until through March, really, for most of your pruning. I, I would add to watch pruning your spring blooming things. A big mistake I find is with lilac. People are pruning, they've got the pruners out. You guys, you love your tools. You can't stop. 
And so you prune off all the flower buds. So it won't hurt the lilac, you just won't have any flowers. You have this beautiful bush with no flowers. Well, you planted a lilac for the flowers. You, you prune your spring blooming things right after they're done blooming. So a lilac would be man. So you put it back then at 25%, 30%. Enjoy the flowers first, then cut it back. For Cynthia, uh, uh, Jasmine, there's a whole bunch of uh, quince, there's a whole bunch of spring blooming things. Enjoy the flowers, then cut it back. All your summer blooming things, uh, Rose of Sharon's, uh, Rose of Sharon's, Crate Myrtles, that kind of stuff, put it back now. Uh, salvia, butterfly bush, uh, sages, put them all back down because they're summer blooming. So they're going to come back when it's finally warm, they're finally going to come back. Uh, grapes, put them back now. Blackberries, put them back down. So those, that's some things to kind of, we'll have a little bit of information coming back to you, but it depends on the plant. It's plant specific, like, like Johnny was saying. Um, when roses are done in the month of March. So you want to get past the worst part of winter and then, then go for those. When you're all done pruning, Spray the entire yard, everything, with all-season oil. This is the least expensive, um, most organic, safest for the birds, your pets, you. Uh, this is just hose down, hose down the entire yard. What I did is I bought my, this is my sprayer that I use. This thing's like 10 years old. Use a hose-in sprayer. You fill this up, you put a hose right here, and I just hose down the yard. And what you're after is, you're trying to fill up all the eggs that are left off. You cut some of the eggs off when you pruned, but there's some left in the main crotches down at the base. You just want to clean everything up so you start the season without insects. They can fly in at you, but at least they're not going to hatch, call up the tree and take over that way. This cleans things up. I don't think you spray enough dormant oil. And I always do that right after I'm done pruning, because then I don't have to spray as much. Basically. And I spray the whole yard. If you have insects at all, spray it. If in doubt, spray it out. And then right after that, I fertilize with all-purpose plant food. I'll do this by the end of March. I'll try to finish my pruning, spray it, and, and, fer and fertilize everything by the end of March. It doesn't matter first part, end of March. Just any time that it's convenient for you, it's time. And then this is what it's going to pick up and, and use to form new leaves, new flowers, that kind of stuff. So that's your sequence that you want to go with. Uh, I know that you're a big advocate of, of, of trenches and stuff. We're really pushing plant protector for the evergreens. We've seen a big outbreak of scale on the pine pines. A lot of customers coming. Bark beetle on the pine roses, the uh, Austrian, the Scotch pine. If it's an evergreen, I would put this down when I'm putting my fertilizer down. And you trench the base of the tree. It absorbs it, and then when the scale finally do hatch, the first part of April, it uh, it they'll they'll pierce the needle, suck the juice out, and it taints the taints the sap. And one application lasts for a year. So if you've got a really valuable tree, some of you bought your lot because of that big ponderosa or beautiful <laughs> pinyon pine or juniper. Those are ones you can't replace them. They're hundreds of years old. If they die and get stressed. You can call a professional, there's no recovery. Once they cross a line, they don't come back. So this will help clean it out. Hey, so Cam. Those, those are some real Cam? inside tips that make you go. Did we start the clipboard around for Who's got the clipboard and sign up board? I see them. Can we have a question back here? Yes. Yeah. Right back here. Yeah. So repeat the question just so these folks can understand what this sycamore tree hasn't been take watered in a while, it's been cared for in a while, it's got dead branches. Uh, what do I do? I okay, that. so sycamore tree, this is a very common problem too. Um, it's brought up by stress. What she's talking about is cankers. Cankers get into the stems on the end and the whole thing dies off. Also, some stuff I've said before, they burn, they die back because they can't use transmission high enough, so everything outside burns on them. 
Um, they can overgrow it. Uh, the canker should be pruned out, but when they're that big, you are, I mean, it takes a long time. I've done a few of them. We'll sit in the bucket truck, we'll prune out all that dead. And they are, there, there's cankers that get in the tips of the, the sycamore trees and prune it out. It can overtake, um, if you start watering it, fertilizing it properly, it can grow past it. Um, but you need to prune out all dead, broken and disease at all times. It does take time, um, but I said if you don't get it out of there, it lives in the tree. You know what I would suggest? I would suggest hiring Johnny to come cut it down for you. And I know a place where you get a brand new, vibrant, uh, <laughs> that will probably be way ahead of trying to get this. It'll be five years before that really recovers. Man, or it, it yeah, takes forever. We have to look at There are some trees, I'll, I'll say that, cut it down. Too much abuse. It's time to start over again. Yeah. So it's talking about the plant protector, so it's a systemic. It travels approximately a foot a day. So if it's a 30 foot tree, it could take a month before it gets to the very top of the tip. So it takes a while for this for the sap to kind of carry this up there. When do you put it down exactly? I don't think it matters. One application lasts for you, just get it down mainly right before spring hits and it's flushing new growth, which would be April. You're starting to see bud growth really start to swell and you're seeing a break on a lot of the uh, April. April is when most evergreens grow. So you can put it on right before that, you're good to go. Does that answer that for you? So I don't, I think sometimes we try to get the exact answer to exact. I think we just need to do it. And it, the, a few days here or there doesn't matter as much. Yeah. yeah. Campus grass, I don't mow back down and break to the ground. There's curly cues. There's about a foot off the ground. You'll see this matting. I cut it back to there. There's three magnificent examples out in the front landscape. As you're driving out, you might want to walk out and just take a look at them. They're in the main landscape by the water's sign. We just cut it back for this, this class. They're cut back to about knee high. I just took shears and we just, we just cut them back with hand shears. Just cut them right back. Uh, you could use your hedge hedgers, whatever. They're nice and sharp. That'll do it. Uh, I wouldn't leave the brown there, or the green new growth would come up through the brown. It looks, it looks bad. I would cut it back to have fresh new, new uh, leaves coming out. Also, fertilize, fertilize, fertilize. We don't fertilize pampas grass enough, so you get these thin, wispy heads. You're planting pampas grass with this tall grass with great big plumes. That takes fertilizer. So you can tell who has not fertilized in your neighborhood, but he's thin, wispy, uh, not as not as high in count. So I would fertilize him as well in the back. Me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have about a five-year-old peach tree that really produced exceptionally well last year. I pruned off like 75 peaches. That seemed like enough, but it wasn't. So now I have branches that are bent. So will those ever straighten out, or do I need to start to prune those off? Okay, so peach tree, uh, too much fruit on it, breaking, snapping, bowing, um, very common problem. Yeah. Uh, fruit trees must be pruned every year to help prevent that, and uh, every time it happens, we need to come in and prune out the ones that yeah, bent, broke, if it's the wrong direction. Yeah, the fruit the trees, direction. you kind of want them to go up like this, you'll prune all that, but if you don't, again, subordinate the tips on them, they're going to get heavy, they're going to fall off. Um, so, and don't be afraid when your fruit tree bloom out. Pick a lot of those off if you think there's too many of them. It's better to do that than have your tree destroyed. Last year, I believe before previously, a lot of my clients had removed their trees because it was that fast. I mean, it just pulled the whole thing and absolutely destroyed it. Yes. Uh, fruit trees also, make sure when it's, if you're planting a new fruit tree, I forgot I, I made a coupon. If you want a new tree, today is the day. <laughs> My planting crew isn't busy enough, so I'm going, how do I get some planting? If you want planting, it's half price today. Basically, the labor's free, aren't you? The mulch and the food and the steaks are all included. That's kind of what it comes down to. So half price planting, just today only, just for the class. Those of you watching online, yes, come in for you too. Just don't need the coupons. Just today, all, all plantings are half price, okay? Uh, make sure when that tree is first planted, especially for fruit trees, that it's staked. We see too many fruit trees not staking and start to lean to the northeast, like Johnny was saying, that southwest prevailing wind gets in the lean, and they load up with fruit, and I've slowly seen 
trees fall out of the ground. They leak out of the ground because the weight is too heavy. So I would say it's really critical. Pruning fruit trees every year is critical. Or they get these long branches, they load up with fruit, and the, the branch snaps off. We want to keep that crown in so they can so it can take on all that weight. Uh, much like he was saying with the evergreens and snow loads, we're doing that for fruit loads on fruit trees. Because there's an art to that. Okay? How about the bird back? Uh, that all-purpose awesome fertilizer, is that the uh, slow release that you were talking about on the radio? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening. <laughs> uh, so it's it's a natural food. So we don't believe in synthetics here, so we like natural foods. And natural foods, the beauty of them are, you don't need as much food, because the plant absorbs all of it just from the ground. And it releases over a much longer period of time. And it's just safer for your pets. It's safer for you. It's just safer for the bird. Just safer. So if that's, you spread it out there, and in about three months, it'll pick up for about three months. Okay, good question. I'll let them back there. Does this uh, tree pruning information apply to bushes too? I heard you mention the word of water storms, and I have a butterfly bush, and I think maybe I have water storms. Cover, cover butterfly. That's, so our question is how to, how to prune back shrubs, specifically butterfly bush. And butterfly bush and weed are generally used in the same sentence. Just a massive, fast growing, push the big butterflies, a great big butterfly bush. How do, you, how do you approach that? Well, pretty much different than most your landscapers do. They come in and they just hedge it down every year. Um, I don't like the way that looks. Yes, you can do it. It can come back from it. But if you ever notice the next year, see all these big rotten cavities and all those stems that were cut off, and then you see die back back to the next lateral buds. Um, they do it, but it's quick and it's cheap, and almost everyone does it that way. I have another take on it. I like to put my butterfly bush like a tree. Um, it looks way better. Um, you have something called a chase tree, it looks, it looks similar to it. So if you take a chase tree and butterfly uh, bush, they can kind of look similar if you prune them right. So I generally go through, I'll elevate them up, print out all the dead crosses, a little bit of dead heading on them, and let it go at that. Water sprouts come in on any plant when it's not making enough food for the tree or it's been stressed out. That's why they do it. Water sprouts are there for a reason. That's why they came in. So when you show someone over prune something, poof, the whole thing turns into a fluff ball. And you're like, well, why, why is that going on? And people continually, well, can you prune them all out? Well, they're not the right thing to prune them all out because they're there for a reason. You print out some, and you leave others for structure to start creating new limbs that shouldn't have been taken out. So you put them back in the plant or the tree, because they're there for a reason. The plant wants to make more food for itself. It wants to cool itself more. That's why I say the hormone, they communicate the root of the crown. So you're trying to create as a harmonious relationship between the two of them by sticking to the rule of thirds. Don't lie inside your plants or your trees. Leave interior inside of them. If a tree has been destroyed by lion tailing, we can come in and do what's called restoration pruning and start using some of those water sprouts to start creating better scalping branches. So the same would kind of apply for a bush as well. Can I add two to that? I think we, we gardeners, especially we're in a garden class the first week in February. Yeah, that says something about you. If you're hardcore, okay? Uh, you're going to be in the nursery regularly. We understand who you are. Uh, some of you need to get over yourselves. Some plants need to die. They need to be gone. So a butterfly bush is one of those. They only look good for about 10 years. Then they just they just look old and crusty and they just lose their vitality. Roses. Roses are not meant to live forever. They're meant to be for a season or a few. So you need to replace those bushes. The whole thing needs to come out and put a new one. I know in Portland, Oregon, they got a famous rose garden. You know, go to England and this is a hundred year old rose tree. We don't live in those places. This is a harsh climate. And sometimes these need to be the rock stars of your yard. Uh, Russian sage, it's beautiful. But if after about six, seven, eight years, it starts to seed and come up and leave, it just seems a big clump. They're really easy to pop out of the ground with a shovel and come out just like in that. So sometimes you need a fresh new one to start over so you're not trying to recover from these. Butterfly bush is one of those. You need to replace them every few years and put a fresh one in. And we're seeing a trend right now we're coming out with, with really good dwarf varieties. So now they'll live a little longer, they bloom longer, and they're less maintenance. So our number one selling lilac is a bloomerang lilac. It's a dwarf variety that's about this big, so you don't have to prune it as often. In fact, I've got one that's been in the ground four years. I, I don't think I've pruned it ever. It just grows this nice little mound. I might give it a little haircut, and it <coughs> blooms. That's the name bloomerang blooms back and forth, much like a rose does, it pulsates flowers. A regular lilac doesn't do that. 
and it, does, it gets your regular lilac is easily head higher higher, this one only gets as big. So we're seeing that with butterfly bush. We're trying to introduce more and more as yards get smaller and folks are traveling. I mean, let's face it, I'm not competing with Home, Home Depot and Lowe's. I'm really easy competing with cruise ship dollars. We all like to travel. We don't want less maintenance. That we tie down. We're seeing that more and more and more. So we're trying to come up with varieties that are easier to maintain, easier to less pruning kind of thing. The secret is the trees. The trees are what add value to your yard, or they detract value. You get a bad tree, it brings you right down. You're not going to sell that baby. There's nothing you can do. It's going to be years before it recovers, and everyone knows it costs a fortune to replace it, to take it out. So the secret is as it grows, as it matures, getting it shaped correctly to start with. Once it's up to size and it's shapely like that, it's, it's just like a beautiful woman on a, on a magazine cover. She's always beautiful. There's something about Sandra Bullock. She just always looks great. She's, how old is she now? If you get an ugly tree, it never turns beautiful. There's nothing you can do. You can't take an ugly thing and make it beautiful. Once it solidifies into that shape, that's it. So keep keep it growing right, and that's where the Johnny is why I have these guys come in and help us out with that. So I do recommend them. He's not paying me to do this. Uh, just he's just he's done my work before, and I needed someone to make me look good. He's the guy. And so let's give him a round, and we'll he'll hang out. <laughs>